Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. This is Laboratory Investigation 6, Inheritance Lab. So the introduction, first purpose, to learn about the patterns of inheritance with sexual reproduction in terms of what genotypes, phenotypes are passed on to offspring. So review, genotypes is the specific combination of alleles or gene parts you've inherited. One allele from each parent for each gene and how they come together and how they express themselves ends up being phenotype. So the phenotype is the physical manifestation of genotype. Sometimes environment does have an impact on phenotype of how the genotype is expressed. Uh, so this lab, we're going to be doing some coin flipping to represent what genotype is being inherited, and that will give a resulting phenotype, some kind of look in the offspring. Materials, two coins, you know, quarters, pennies. Uh, if you're not in America, hey, any coins will do. Uh, the point is to have um, you know, one side is different from the other, tails and heads. Uh, one lab partner, it's much more fun to do this where one person uh, each has a coin and together flipping the coins is, is replicating which allele is in the sperm and in the egg that's going to be um, you know, passed on uh, to form the offspring. So if, if two girls are doing this, for the purposes of this, one of them would have to represent the male. If, if two boys are doing this, well, one of them has to represent the female. Uh, because in terms of which partner in the sexual reproduction simulation determines the sex of the baby, um, we do need to have that differentiation, and, and you'll see on the next slide why that is. Um, and you do have to have a list of genotype-phenotype combos in terms of what's possible to be inherited. You know, when we flip these coins, what does that all mean? And I'll give you uh, some examples of what could be there. Um, there are lots of different versions of this lab. It's very commonly done. Um, in bio biology classrooms. So the time required about fi uh, 30 minutes rather. Explanation, all right, so assume that you and your partner are both heterozygous for every genotype in your body. The reason why that's important is because the Punnett squares would all look like this. If you remember, Punnett squares are meant to be a visual representation of the probability of inheritance for these uh, allelic combinations of what's going to end up uh, as your genotype. So if both individuals are heterozygous, mom and dad, here's the possible genotypes that you end up getting in the uh, F1. If these are the P generation, and this is that filial F generation, you can see that there is a um, 1 to 2 to 1 genotypic ratio. And depending on the specific trait we're talking about, uh, there could be a 3 to 1 uh, genotypic ratio where all three of these look the same. And then there'll be some other scenarios where this, this, and this all are actually different. There'll be three different phenotypes. And I'll explain that on the next slide. Uh, so for each trait, you and your partner will flip the coin. If it lands on heads, the allele is dominant for that individual in terms of what they're passing on. So if both people flip heads, you're getting this. If one of you flips heads and one of you flips tails, it'll be that. If it goes the other way where you both flip tails and heads but the opposite happens, it ends up being the same genotype. But that's why there's a 50% chance of that happening. Uh, heterozygous is, is going to happen statistically 50% of the time. If you both flip tails, you're going to get that recessive, uh, homozygous recessive case. Now, before you get started with all these different traits on the next slide, uh, you've got to determine what the sex of the baby is going to be. And this has to do with what sex chromosome is actually in the sperm that fertilizes the egg. So if we do a little, you know, mini Punnett square for how a mom and a dad are contributing the sex chromosomes to the baby. Females are XX. So every egg should have just an X chromosome. But with sperm, half the sperm are going to have the X, half the sperm are going to have the Y. And so whichever partner in the scenario is representing the man, that particular person flips it once. So you can see that, hey, there's a 50% female. 50% male. So they're going to flip it once. It's, it's basically flipping whether or not it's going to be that or that. Uh, so they flip once. If it's heads, then that means an X chromosome fertilized the egg. If it's tails, it means that 
a Y chromosome fertilize the egg and it's a male baby. All right, the basic procedure. So here's an example of the traits that you're gonna be flipping for. So let's say for hairstyle, there's curly as a phenotype, wavy as a phenotype, and straight as a phenotype. So those three different phenotypes and the genotypes look like this. So if you both flip heads, hey, curly hair. If you each flip, you know, the opposites, wavy hair. If you both flip tails, straight hair. So that's an example where you actually have a one to two to one ratio of phenotypes in addition to genotypes. There are three actual combinations. Here's a case where you don't have that, like with Widow's Peak. Let me use W's for this particular one. So you can get big W, big W, that's homozygous dominant. You get heterozygous and you can get homozygous recessive. Turns out that both of these equals a widow's peak having that particular uh, trait. And in case you don't know, widow's peak, if you look at the, uh, the hairline, it coming to a point here, like a little triangle in the middle, that's a widow's peak. Uh, this homozygous recessive, no widow's peak. So if you don't inherit the dominant allele, it'll look like mine where it's straight. So here's an example where it actually is a three to one ratio. There's actually a 75% chance of getting a widow's peak, only a 25% chance uh, of flipping um, the uh, homozygous recessive case. Now with face shape, it could be uh, you know round or more squared off, ear size, uh, large, medium, small. So you actually have three there. Nose, large, medium, small, lip size, large, medium, small. Cleft chin could be something like Widow's Peak where um, homozygous dominant heterozygous give you that uh, you know, little dimple. Some people call it a butt chin. Um, I have a slight one, but it's, it's hard to see because uh, of my goatee. Uh, freckles is another one where just one dominant allele could give it to you. So uh, that could be where there's only you know, two, two options. Freckles with at least one dominant allele or no freckles. Dimples could be the same case. Now the actual lab I hand out has I would say twice as many as this. Um, and it's fun. You know, students are doing these coin flips and some of them are moaning like, oh man, our kid got this or our kid got this. And some of them will say, oh, our kid is ugly. And I tell them, hey, you be proud of your child because they came from you and you will love them regardless. Uh, so they have some fun doing this. And at the end, they draw a picture of what the child would look like. They name it. It's, it's pretty fun. All right, so... Analysis. After doing these coin flips and saying, hey, this is what was inherited, this is what was inherited, how realistic is this lab activity? Well, it certainly has its limitations. Um, is it true that there's just three hairstyles, curly, wavy, straight? No, there's actually more than that. Uh, there's probably multiple genes influencing exactly how your hair curls or doesn't curl. Um, in terms of hair color, definitely more than one gene. The shape of your face, certainly lots of genes. There's lots of skull bones that are formed to, to make the exact shape and slope of your face, the size of your jaw, the, the angles of your face, um, the cranium size, like everything, all those little minutia that we don't even notice, those, there are genes influencing that. So this is certainly more simplistic of a lab. It's, it's designed to be fun, it's designed to bring the concept of a Punnett square into a more uh, real format that students can grasp. So most of the traits mentioned in this lab are actually affected by more than one gene, uh, polygenic or polygenetic inheritance. Um, that's when more than one gene influences a single trait. By the way, there are 25,000 to 30,000 genes that code for proteins in the human genome. Um, some sources say there are at least 20,000. I've heard up to 30,000. So this is the approximation I like to go with. Um, this is, by the way, what's coding for proteins in terms of what we know for a fact is, is um, producing products in the, in the body. Um, there's plenty more genes than that, and we call that junk DNA. Um, it could be that some of that junk DNA that seems useless, which is the vast majority of genetic material, uh, is actually doing 
things we haven't noticed yet, more regulatory um, or promoting kind of um, um, promoting sort of factors and sort of promoting, hey, that gene needs to be read. Don't read that gene at different times um, during uh, an individual's life. So a lot of it is still kind of up in the air in terms of what we know about DNA. Um, I think we're just scratching the surface. But yeah, this is my best approximation for how many genes are actually you know, making proteins. And some proteins are visible, like the proteins that affect your hair color or affect your skin color or affect, um, you know, how tall you are. You can't actually see the proteins. That's why I'm saying visible, meaning the effects of the proteins are visible because proteins in themselves are microscopic. So whether it's enzymes or um, structural uh, proteins, globular proteins, uh, some of them do impact, you know, traits that you can see on the surface, but most, even their uh, physical manifestations are not visible. It's stuff going on inside the body. Um, doesn't mean they're not there. Uh, I like this image. It's, you know, taking one of those condensed duplicated chromosomes and, and taking out uh, the DNA from it so you can see that double-stranded uh, molecule, the double helix, and bringing us back to that concept of exons and introns related to um, RNA processing. All right, inheritance laws connection. So the point of the lab is to illustrate the two main laws of Mendelian inheritance. So the law of segregation states that, hey, when you're making pollen, eggs, sperm, whatever it might be, and you've got homologous chromosomes lined up during metaphase one of meiosis, the law of segregation says, hey, these are going to segregate, meaning those gene parts are going to be split up. Um, half the amount of DNA is in sperm and egg in each one of those cells. That's where we get that term haploid from rather than diploid. So, and then once we get to metaphase two and then anaphase two, we end up getting these in the you know sperm and egg. So that's that law of segregation where we're splitting up that information. Uh, this corresponds to having like, hey, A, you know, maybe this is from dad and this is from mom. And since it's duplicated, it would be like that and like that. By the time you get to here, it would be like that. And then this particular sperm, this particular egg, you have the dominant allele on that chromosome, the recessive allele on that. So that's the law of segregation related to the genotypes you see in a Punnett square. And then the law of independent assortment, meaning all the different uh, genes, the ones that affect height, um, the ones that affect skin color, hair color, eye color, the ones that affect personality, the ones that affect um, how you heal, the ones that affect metabolism, whatever it might be they're inherited independently. They don't have an impact on one another. So just because you flip the coins and end up getting dimples doesn't mean you're going to get freckles. Just because you flip and get freckles doesn't mean you're going to get a widow's peak. That doesn't mean you won't get a widow's peak. Uh, the exception to this is the concept of linked genes. So Mendel didn't know about that at the time, but um, there are cases where certain genes are inherited together, and those are called linked genes, but other than that, uh, independent assortment is, uh, is for real, and it helps us understand um, the randomness of inheritance, and that's great in terms of um, the amount of variety that we have in our species. Thanks for watching Educator.com.